I'm Kevin Flaherty. I'm sitting with John Butcher, guitarist, singer, songwriter, and recording artist. Um, John, why don't we begin at the beginning? What what uh, caused you to pick up the guitar in the first place? Gene Autry. Really? I, I uh, and growing up where I grew up in the in the remote uh, in a remote area, you uh, you are linked to whatever outside input you can get. And for me, that was uh, Saturday morning uh, uh, westerns, uh, singing cowboys, Gene Autry, Hopalong Cassidy. And that was really the genesis of, of why I wanted to play guitar. I figured he got the horse, he got the girl, that looks good to me. And you've mentioned Jeff Beck a lot before, too, in the later period. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that, that's once I realized that I wasn't really very good and I wanted to be better. Jeff Beck was, is, and Jimi Hendrix were the models that me and others of my generation really gravitated to. Okay. Um, and flashing forward to the 80s now, in, you formed the Axis in what year? Um, you know, uh, as near as I can recollect, the, uh, the, the Axis was about 1983 or 1984. Uh, Chris Martin, Derek Blevins on drums. Chris, of course, played bass. And uh, we were just a local band playing in Boston uh, that came to the attention of Peter Wolf of the Jay Giles Band, who took us on the uh, freeze frame tour, and we never looked back. Really? Yeah. yeah any memories from that tour? Anything stand out? <laughs> Yeah, um, almost every night was 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 a uh, was a memory because everything was new input. I had never played stadiums before or arenas or anything of the sort, and uh, I think the first the first series of gigs that we did with the Jay Giles Band were in uh, Detroit, Michigan, at Cobol Hall uh, for ten thousand people, and I thought I was going to die. Uh, Peter Wolf came backstage and uh, he gave some football advice, hit him low, hit him hard, and run off the stage as fast as you can. They were good to you guys. Absolutely true, yeah. yeah. Without them, I don't think any of this would have happened. Really? Yeah. Now, you've mentioned before also that you originally wanted to get a singer for the Axis. You didn't have any designs on being their front man. Oh, were... yeah, man. I hated my voice. I didn't mean I hated it. And others joined me in hating my voice in Boston, as near, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, near as I can recollect. Uh, I had uh, a couple friends at WBCN, and, and uh, I don't think I, I, th there was some doubt as to whether or not I, I should be the vocalist for the band. But we never found anybody that we liked, and I just stuck with the job. It was on a necessity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, was it a pretty quick metamorphosis to being a songwriter for the band and and kind of carrying it in that respect? Well, yeah. I mean, somebody, you know, when you when when things are new like that and you're sort of just finding your legs, someone had to take the role. Uh, in the early days of Axis, of course, we wrote some things together, Chris, Chris Martin and myself, but I more and more took on the responsibility because I enjoyed doing it. Right. Yeah. Now, how did the polygram signing come about? That was that after the guy. It tour? was after the tour. Yeah, we had uh, we had made a big noise, and and uh, everyone was excited. And so, by the time we had finished with the tour, we more or less had a record deal in place. Really? Yeah. And now, how do you think that the live concert experience has changed since that time for you and and for the audiences as well? You know, it it, it as near as I can as near as I can remember, those days were were. I'm I'm not sure I would say they were beginning days for for uh, rock touring, though they were certainly the beginning for MTV and that sort of thing. And uh, is as I see it, touring now is such a big uh, business machine, and things are so organized and that and the stakes are so high that there's very little things that are left to chance. We would uh, we'd play some shows and fill in shows on the tour that were booked two days ago or or, or two days prior. Uh, and I'm not sure there's that latitude to have that sort of uh, mobility to try mm -hmm. things and to go here or there uh, because everything's pretty much mapped out. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this show was recorded at the Palace in 1987. Um, are there any other shows that were memorable for any reason? What, what's your worst live experience that you can recall? The worst live experience that I can really think of was uh, on tour with NXS. We might have been mismatched in that uh, at that time they were drawing uh, really young girls to come see us. And so I came on stage and I'm playing a Marshall amp and a, a Stratocaster way too loud. And I think they hated us. So they started pitching candy at the stage and we, had, you know, we beat a hasty retreat after two or three songs. <laughs> That's probably the worst experience, but it was just a mismatch. And in retrospect, I'm glad that happened because we got it on film and it looks really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the songwriting now, you're, I think ever since the beginning of the Axis up and through your solo career, your songwriting employs the idea of war a lot as a metaphor for everything, including human emotions. And your characters in your songs seem to have an eye on, 
on a better day, even if their circumstances aren't that great. Right. That's the optimist in me, hoping to make uh, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes I think that uh, so there, are, there are times I think that relationships are warfare. And, uh, and I don't mean to take that combative outlook. It's just that I'm sure, it, it, as anyone listening to this will, will agree with, being in a relationship is, is tough going. And that conflict is what makes people write poetry and, and write music. And it's, it's out of conflict that those things are written. So maybe that's a good thing. Would you call some of that period almost a contemporary blues treatment in a way? It seems to have a lot of the same themes as blues music. And it certainly oh, precipitated your return to Yeah, Yeah, um, that was, wasn't a conscious thing, Kevin. It, 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 was never, it was never in my head to go, okay, now I'm going to make a, I'll, I'll return to more more blues styling. The fact is that that element already existed, as you pointed out, and I think it just sort of crystallized as as uh, as time went on. And now you said also that you've had some difficulty with the image making. That uh, it was tough to find your own road there for a while. Well, being compared to uh, a living legend is 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 a double edged sword at best. Uh, my compare my early c- the comparisons made between me and and Jimi Hendrix were were good in so much as it, it, it's great company to be in, and bad in so much as trying to, to, to make your own identity. The fact is, I don't think I, outside of the, uh, the surface aspect, I don't think there was much about me that was Jimi Hendrix-like, if you disregard the fact that I'm black and play a Stratocaster. So what is it exactly that precipitated your solo career in 1986, is it? Uh, desperation. Yeah. I mean, uh, I had decided that it... When when something ends, something else begins, and it was my feeling that with the end of the axis and the beginning of of uh, it had to be the beginning of something else, and since I couldn't very well walk away from myself, a solo career is born. And that's the period you're proudest of, is that right? Out of I all think the catalog, so. you a- like absolutely the true. wishes album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything from then on seemed to ha- have a, a a natural flow and and really was reflective of what I was trying to do. Okay. And at what point did you switch to really authentic blues music? Did I ever do that? <laughs> <laughs> There's people that, that, that listen to the blues CDs that might disagree with you. Uh, I'm not sure how authentic it is. It came from the heart. It's and, a more stripped down version I yeah, think, of the blues yeah. that you played before. Yeah, that's And you tr- shelved the electric guitar for a while. In some ways I did, yeah. You know what? Uh, it's funny. Um, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing film scoring right now. And uh, that really brought me back again to the electric guitar in that it was another color that I didn't want to completely ignore. But it was something that in order to, you know, as I said, in order to reinvent songwriting and reinvent myself, it was something to, it was another way of walking away from one door and opening up another. I see. Yeah. So let's talk about this show in specific here, uh, The Palace 1987 Uh, I see a great many songs here, including a cover of Higher Ground that wraps it up. Yeah, I got to tell you something. Uh... I'd like to take credit. We were first, before the Red Hot Chili Peppers, ever thought about doing this song. We covered it, and uh, of course, they recorded it years later. I'd like to go on the record as saying, and, and I think they did a great job, but I think we did a better job. So what can okay. I tell you? <laughs> Where did this track Heaven come from? Um, uh, s- some of those songs that we played in that concert, Kevin, were, were born right backstage before we went on. We would had a shortage of material that we could actually play live, you know, we couldn't do all of the songs that were on the album. Some were overproduced or some just didn't lend themselves to being on a, you know, on a, on a rock tour. And so what we did is a lot of times backstage, we'd make stuff up right on the spot. And Heaven was a song, I think, that, we, that came out of the dressing room. Okay. Are there any other specific memories from the show? Anything strange um, happened? No, I didn't get beat up at all during that tour. <laughs> <laughs> d- during that tour. Uh, you know, par- part of, of what is, is such a fond memory for me is the people that I worked with. In this case, the incarnation of Axis, or the John Butcher uh, band, according to how you look at it, was uh, Jamie Carter on bass, uh, Ronnie Sage on drums, uh, Tom Gimble, who uh, plays keyboards for Aerosmith, was at that time playing with me. And so uh, when I think back on those times, I think back about long tour bus rides, and those were the funniest guys I've ever been on the road with. Yeah. So that period was really special to me because it was chock full of laughs. So what, uh, what else was going on with you at the time of this show? I mean, let's put everybody in a place here. This is July 1987. Yeah. Where's John Butcher at? Okay, let's see. Um, we, were, um, we had done a, 
we had were in the middle of this tour. I think L.A. was, if not the the, the first show, certainly the first couple shows that we did. Of course, Wishes had come out not n- not that much prior, and we were on a high because the album was selling really well. Uh, we were doing uh, we were at the early stages of MTV and doing videos. So we had a video playing. I think it was Holy War, which was also in the show and with air raid sirens and bombast and. A lot of other stuff that seems really stupid now, but, <laughs> but it really was a lot of fun then. And we had also done a couple of a couple of different things with King Biscuit, of which this was only one. Uh, uh, those times were really, really high for us, uh, which is just a metaphor, by the way. Let's yeah, not read I'm too sure. much into that, please. Um, th- th- they were high times because it was it was it was an opportunity to change people's perceptions up until that date about what I was about. You know, Kevin, I wasn't really that happy with some of the earlier recordings, as I'd mentioned to you once before, because there were a lot of of, uh, influences pulling me in several different directions. And so uh, around this time, we had kind of crystallized what really worked and what didn't. And we had gotten the live show down to to, to a science. I mean, it it was a good time had by all. And and those guys indulged in every rock and roll excess possible, short of anything self-destructive. So it was it was really fun. And in terms of the studio work at this time and the live work, did you find yourself making a minimum of compromises at this point? I mean, you're working with high-level producers. Yeah. You're, you're getting a lot of push from the label. Was there still an attempt to kind of corral you, or were you well, finding a lot of freedom? You know, we had, we had talked about this once before, where there was a feeling about... Uh, a, a black guys playing rock and and what the best thing was to get on the radio and i'm not sure that uh i think it was around that period that we had shed that sort of distraction and just concentrated on the you know the job at hand at making music 